Thank you for joining us today. We're excited that you came across this message. The sermon you are about to watch is from our teaching series, The Life of a Jesus Follower. At Hope Church, we believe in connecting people to live the life of a Jesus follower. And we do this through abiding in Christ, connecting in community, and sharing in the mission. In this foundational teaching series to the life of our church, we will discover together what it looks like to live the life of a Jesus follower. If you're joining us for the first time, I wanna be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit us at hopechurchlv.com. Click Las Vegas Congregation and fill out the short digital connection card so we can get to know you better. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, church. My name is Dondra Pooler, and my husband Jerry and I have been members of Hope Church for six years. Right now, I have the great privilege of serving on the stewardship team. And today, I have joy and honor to read God's word with you. We will be in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 42 and 43. And when it was day, he departed and went to a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Dondra. Appreciate that. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Luke chapter 4. If you haven't already, we're going to be in that passage of Scripture in just a few moments once again. So glad you've joined us. Can't wait to jump into God's Word with you. When my wife and I, Candace, started having children, one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to celebrate big milestone birthdays. Last month, we reached another milestone birthday in my family. My daughter, Avery, turned 13 years old. I now have two teenagers in my house. And so for the 13th birthday, what we told our, our kids, now my oldest son, Bryce, and now Avery, is... You get to pick a trip. You get to help us plan a trip, plan an adventure. So we did a thing with Bryce and was all into what he wanted to do in the East Coast. We went to New York and Washington, D.C. and did a bunch of tourism stuff. But my beach-loving, good-tasting food daughter, Avery, wanted to go on a cruise, ladies and gentlemen. Now, listen, I've heard a lot about cruises. My dad said he's a big cruiser. Like, the cruise life is a good life, okay? We went on a cruise last week. If you've never been on a cruise, I do recommend it. But you get something as soon as you get on board the cruise that is everything for you. I actually brought mine from last week. We went on a Royal Caribbean cruise. So here's what we got when we loaded the, bo the, the boat. A sea pass. This thing right here, if you know, you know. This is everything. If you lose this, you are not going to have much fun on the cruise. You say, why? Because this is how you get in your room. It's your room card or your room key. This is how you get off of the boat at the ports. This is how you get onto the boat at the port. So it's very important at the port, you don't lose your sea pass. This is how you pay for things. Every day, you're like, do you have your sea pass? They're like, do you have sea pass, sea pass? It's like every single moment you are being told about your sea pass. This is how you get towels for the pool. You can do nothing on the cruise without the sea pass. The sea pass is everything. Your journey on a cruise, at least the Royal Caribbean cruise, would not be very enjoyable without the sea pass. You say, why are you beginning that way this morning? For the last several, seven weeks, we've been looking at the spiritual sea pass, if you will, the foundational necessity for what it means to follow Jesus. We put it on the screen every single week. I actually want to put it on the screen again, and I want us to read it out loud. This is the spiritual sea pass. Let's read this out loud. One, two, three. The life of a Jesus follower is all about relationships. We will not go and, and, and do a review of the last seven weeks. If you've just joined us, go ahead and go online. We've been looking at what this looks like for seven weeks on our anniversary weekend. It's so cool to, to talk about this because this has been foundational in the, the 23 years of Hope Church's existence. When our founding pastors came here to make disciples in the city of Las Vegas, they started to study the life of Jesus, and they saw that Jesus' life revolved around three primary relationships. We'll review for just a moment. He had a relationship with God. For us as followers of Jesus, we abide in Christ. We also have a relationship with God. Jesus had a relationship with his disciples. We have relationships now with other disciples. We say we connect in community, and Jesus had a relationship with the people that didn't know God at all, the world. So we, as his followers now, as he lives his life in and through us, our lives will look the same. We will abide in Christ. 
We will connect in community and we will share in the mission. Just like this sea pass on our cruise, without this foundation, the journey of following Jesus will not be very enjoyable. We spent two weeks unpacking what it means to abide in Christ. We spent two weeks unpacking what it looks like to connect in community. And last week, Pastor Tom did a great job beginning our discussion on how a Jesus follower shares in the mission. Now, if you weren't here last week, I just want to catch us all up. This is the one where a lot of people in the church go, nope, (laughs) I don't know about that one. Like, I'm all good with spending time with God, abiding in Christ. Yes, yes, yes. I'm even good to get outside of my comfort zone and connect in some community. I'm good with abiding in Christ and connecting in community. But, but sharing in the mission, this is the one that is reserved for the spiritual elite. Like you got to get to some level of Christianity to do that one. That might be okay for those Christians, but not this Christian. And what Pastor Tom did such a great job of last week is showing us from God's word, this is the call on our lives as followers of Jesus, as he lives his life in and through us. What will come out of our lives will look like what he did. What he did is now what we will do as he lives his life through us. So I'm going to double down on that, looking at that passage. We'll spend most of our time there, but we're going to be in a lot of God's word today. Hopefully, if you if you'd like to flip to every passage we go to, you're going to be busy today because we're going to look at a lot of God's word to show you this is all over the scriptures for us as followers of Jesus. So once again, Luke chapter 4, we're going to read these few verses as we jump in today. God's word says, when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him. And would have kept them, him from leaving them, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Very simply this morning, out of this passage, I want to give us two truths about following Jesus. We're actually going to start at verse 43 and then go to verse 42. We're going to kind of flip the script. Two truths about following Jesus right out of this text. Here's the first one. As I follow Jesus, what is on his heart will be on my heart. As I follow Jesus, what is on his heart will be on my heart. Now, before we talk about the spiritual implications, I want you to assume and understand that this is not just for a relationship with God. This is true of all relationships. If you've been married for any length of time, you know that you just start to like some of the same things. Not clones, but you just start to to like some of the same things. I've experienced this with my boys. They're in the service today as well with my family. Uh, 15 years ago, before we had kids, There was one Dallas Cowboys fan in that Worthington home. (laughs) It was me. I tried for 20 years to get my wife to like football. She doesn't care at all. I've sat her down. Listen, this is an amazing game. You have to understand this. She does not care. She still doesn't understand it. You can talk about that with her after the service and maybe pray for her so she'll jump on board, okay? (laughs) But then we started having some kids. Specifically, my two boys. In fact, right now, in this moment, they're wearing Dallas Cowboy hats because what is on my heart has gotten on their heart. In fact, I'd say it because they're in the room. I've created a couple little monsters, ladies and gentlemen. They are a little intense. I've had to kind of talk them down. But seriously, what's on my heart for the Dallas Cowboys has come on their heart. They know exactly when they play. And if you grew up in the 90s like me, you know there's just a really harsh dislike of the San Francisco 49ers. It's just in you. And then, of course, it's in you to just not like the Eagles. I'm sorry for you Eagles and 49ers fans, but that's just who we are as Cowboy fans. And that's who I have been. And guess what? That's who my boys are now because what is on my heart has become what is on their heart. We understand this. Why is that a thing? Because our relationship is healthy. And so I'm passing passing on my passions. So let's look at Luke 4. What is the passion we see in Luke 4 that should be on our heart as we follow Jesus? Just to give you some context, what's happening in this passage is Jesus is right in the middle of of doing ministry. He's healing people. He's teaching people. He's really living the life that we've been describing the last seven weeks. He's he's living a life abiding in his relationship with the Father and and connecting his relationship with other disciples and and sharing in the mission. He's talking to the, the people that don't know God about what's on his heart. So what's on his heart? Let's look at a couple things that are on his heart. The first thing we see here is God's kingdom. What is on Jesus' heart here is God's kingdom. Look back at verse 43. He says, I must, I must preach the kingdom, the, the, the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. 
This is just another day in Jesus' ministry. It says in the beginning, he, it was just as the another day came, and we see a very important word in verse 43. It's must. It's a word that it describes passion. It's a word that means it's an absolute necessity. It's inevitable. This is going to happen. Why? Because he was passionate about it. It was a, an all-consuming passion that we see all throughout Jesus' life. So what's the, what's the absolute necessity that we see him communicating here? Preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. There's a good church phrase that if you've been around this type of environment for any length of time, you've heard. But I wonder if you would be able to answer the question, what is the kingdom of God? Right? It's one of those ones that we hear, but like, have you ever been asked, what is the kingdom of God? That's a great question to ask. I hope after today you understand and can communicate what the kingdom of God is. In light of this being our 23-year anniversary, I want to quote our founding pastor, Pastor Vance Pittman. He, he communicated the kingdom of God this way over and over and over again for over two decades. Pastor Vance said, the kingdom of God is God's sovereign activity in the world, resulting in people being in right relationship with himself. Let's break that down a little bit. The kingdom of God is God's sovereign activity. Don't misunderstand this. There is a king of the kingdom, and his name is Jesus it's his sovereign activity in the world resulting in people being in right relationship with him. What does that mean? The things that we've been talking about for seven weeks resulting in people because of God's sovereign activity, the king of the kingdom is at work right now resulting in people being in right relationship, abiding in Christ, connecting in community, sharing in the mission. And it is all over the New Testament. In fact, over a hundred times in 16 different books of the New Testament, we, we hear about this thing called the kingdom of God to remind us that our little lives that we have here are not all that there is in the kingdom of God. He's not only called us to be a part of the kingdom, but he has called us to expand the kingdom. This is an all-consuming passion in Jesus's life. In fact, some of you may know this who are Bible scholars, but after Jesus was resurrected, if you know the story of Jesus, he came to live a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again three days later, and the Bible actually tells us he was on the earth for 40 days after he was resurrected. And the Bible tells us what he was doing for those 40 days. Let's look at it in the beginning pages of the book of Acts, Acts chapter one, verse one, the very first words of Acts say this, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay, what's going on here? If you're, not, if you're new to Bible study, he says in my first book, who wrote the book of Acts? Well, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and so he's talking about the first book. It's called the Gospel of Luke. So what's he saying here? He said, hey, I wrote about all that Jesus did as life, death, and resurrection in my first book, the Gospel of Luke, and now I want to tell you what he is doing right now. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. According to Luke, Jesus' all-consuming passion for 40 days after the resurrection was speaking about the kingdom of God, God's activity in the world, bringing people to himself. So just for a little while, I want to double-click on that for just a moment. What is the kingdom, and how do we understand it? I want to give you three biblical realities about the kingdom, all from God's word, three biblical realities about the kingdom. Here's the first one. The kingdom is believers. The kingdom is believers. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. This is a beautiful picture of the future reality that we as followers of Jesus will be caught up in. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. What's he talking about? He's talking, about, he's talking to Jesus, the Lamb of God that was slain, the King of the kingdom. And you have made them a, what's that word? kingdom. Who's them in this passage? Them is every single follower of Jesus from all of the ages gathered around in this glorious picture of the future reality that we will be gathered around the kingdom because he has made us a kingdom. He has made us a kingdom. The kingdom is believers. So what that means is as you walk with people who are followers of Christ, as you gather in the lobby, as you gather as a group, as we gather in this place, we are a picture of the kingdom of God happening right here and now. The kingdom is believers. Here's the second 
reality of the kingdom. The kingdom is big. The kingdom is big. That passage that we just looked at in Revelation 5 says every tribe, language, people, and nation. I love reading those passages of scripture because it takes my eyes off my little world and expands the horizons. It is so much bigger than just what I've got going on. Right now, we have a team in the field in Italy expanding the kingdom to, to, uh, to, to Muslim refugees there in, in Italy. They're sharing the gospel and hoping to see more people join in to the kingdom of God because the kingdom is big. On Tuesday, we have some ladies going to South Asia to talk to, to people that don't know God at all, that are very far, maybe even never heard the name of Jesus, and, and to invite them into the kingdom because the king wants a relationship with them. Today, Last week, we are praying that God would expand all of our horizons to see that he wants you to be involved in what he's doing. So maybe you'll be a goer and you'll go somewhere, but maybe you'll be on a prayer team praying every single day for these trips that we send out. Maybe you'll be a sender and financially contribute to what God's doing among the peoples of the earth. I'm so blessed that over the last 17, 18 years of me being a part of Hope Church, I've been able to see on the ground some incredible things specifically with what he's doing in the kingdom of God and the nations. Last year, Pastor Tom and I were able to, to travel to South Asia. In fact, we were able to go to a lot of our different partners and, and visit them, but one of the places we went is South Asia. And in case you aren't sure, it's, it takes a long time to get from Henderson, Nevada to South Asia. <laughs> It takes a long time, a lot of plane flights, a lot of traveling, a lot of looking at each other and going, what day is it today? And so we went, actually we were coming from Southeast Asia, visiting another one of our partners, and we took a, a multiple hour flight down to South Asia, and, and we are looking at each other like, what time is it? It was about 11.30 p.m. when we got to this major city in South Asia, and we drive to the airport, and there are just people everywhere. I've never seen this amount of people, especially at 11.30 at night. I'm going, man, what's it gonna be like during the day? <laughs> We get to the hotel, finally, I just pass out because I know the next morning we're supposed to get up and we're supposed to go do some ministry. They said, out in the villages. I said, okay, I don't know what that means. We wake up, we get in a van, we just start driving again, just more people than I've ever seen in my life. We're driving and then we take this dirt road and remember, we're in a van. We didn't have like a four-wheel drive truck. We start driving and we keep driving and I'm like, where are we going? Do we trust these people? Are we good to go here, Tom? We keep going, we run to a, a van that, was stuck in the mud and, and we thought we, should, we probably shouldn't keep driving. We still have a while to drive, but we'll just walk. And I'm like, okay, let's just walk. So we get out of the car. I want to show you a picture. We're so out in the boonies. Me, me and Pastor Tom ran into this guy right here. We just ran, we were so out there. I said, hey, Pastor Tom, we just got to take a picture of our little friend here, okay? So we just keep walking. It's beautiful, as you can see. We're just walking and walking for what feels like forever. And there's a picture of where we were walking and, and it's just out there. And I, I, I gave you this little picture because there's this stream here that to give you a funny mental picture, if you know Pastor Tom, all of us, everyone in that line and me taking that picture, Pastor Tom's behind me, we all had sandals on. Well, Pastor Tom did not. He had jeans and vans on, okay? So we get to this river and he looks at me and he says, hey, Scott, how am I supposed to get across this river? I said, Tom, you love the nations. You're about to take those shoes off, roll up your jeans, and you're supposed to walk across the river. And I wish I could show you the picture, but we have some faces that we can't show on that picture. But Pastor Tom did it because he loves the people of the earth, but it was a very funny moment. So we keep walking, we keep walking, and then we turn the corner, and I see something that I will forever be marked by. I snapped this picture. It was a little church out in the middle of nowhere. Why am I sharing this with you? Because the kingdom of God is big. I'm telling you, what we're doing right here is we're gathering as Hope Church. For 23 years, we've seen God do some cool things here. But there's a church out. If you gave me a million dollars, I would never be able to find this again by myself. So far out there, I couldn't even tell you where to begin. And yet there is this gathering of about 100 plus people. This used to be a man's home, or this is a man's home, who used to be a part of the Hindu faith. And he had this incredible, miraculous encounter with Jesus where he submitted his life to Christ and said, I want more people to know this. So we just started inviting his neighbors and a church began, a church grew. I'll put, show you a picture of our partner, Melissa. Many of you know Matt and Melissa. We sent them out last year. They are doing incredible things. I hope you have their, 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 their prayer car maybe on your, your refrigerator or something. This is a couple you should be praying for often because they are doing what, what I thought was a crazy thing to do. They're doing it day in and day out there in South Asia. But, but she gets up to, to share with the ladies on the right and the men on the left, and she just began to encourage them and pray for them. And I will never forget this moment. They started to sing, and I couldn't understand their language. I don't know what they were saying. I don't know who, what they were singing, but I knew who they were singing to. Why? Because the same king that I worship and we worship in here every single Sunday is the same king that they're worshiping out in that village in South Asia. 
because the kingdom of God is big. The kingdom is believers. The kingdom is big. Third the reality, the kingdom is being built. Right now, the kingdom is being built. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Whoa. The end. The end of what? The end of the world as we know it. And if you're a 90s kid like me, you can't help but sing that song by R.E.M. It's the end. Uh, Some of you are doing it. I know, I know. If you don't know the context of this passage, Jesus is teaching about the last days, the birth pains that will come as a sign of the end of the age. I just got to tell you, church, this is a burden for me right now. I'm praying a lot about this as we enter into this crazy season. Not as we enter in. We are in. We are officially in the crazy season of our American lives. There's so much talk right now about the end and everything that's going on. We can so, even as the followers of Jesus, get caught up in some of the crazy. It's a burden for me because we live in a world where even Christians have been duped into thinking that some human scheme or human event is going to destroy everything. As if God is in heaven, wringing his hands, going, I don't know what I'm gonna do if that person wins the presidency. I don't know what I'm gonna do if this happens. And I know we're laughing, but we can get caught up in this. As if the king of the kingdom is stressing out about our little empire building. Even as a church, we can fall prey to this. And if that party wins, it's the end of the world as we know it, right? If, if Kamala gets in or, or Donald Trump gets in, well, something's going to happen and we won't be able to recover. If China or Russia, listen, are these real things with real consequences? Absolutely, yes. But all under the sovereignty of God. Listen, we cannot let what we see override what we've already read in this book. And here's what we've read in this book. The end of the world as we know it will not come because some evil that humans do. It will come when the king has done all he has purposed to do. And then what will happen? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, then comes the end. Look at this picture. When he, that's Jesus, the king of the kingdom, delivers the kingdom to God the Father. What a picture. Father, it's done. After destroying every rule and every authority and power. See, we've got this backwards today. So many of us, many of us are afraid that the evil will triumph over the godly authority. No, no, no. Don't get it twisted, Hope Church. Wait, may we be a people, followers of Jesus, who know that the godly authority will always reign because God is the king and he is on his throne. The kingdom is not out of control. He's working in the waiting. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, that something is happening right now. The gospel of the kingdom, the glorious good news is being proclaimed all over the world. And don't miss this, church. The kingdom of God is growing even as the world is groaning for his return. It's this tension that we feel I feel, you feel, I don't want to act like everything is rosy. In fact, it's one of my favorite theological realities. If you sit in Hope Church long enough, you're going to hear me talk about the the aspect of the kingdom that theologians call the already, but the not yet. It's this tension that we feel. What on earth does that mean? As followers of Jesus, there are aspects of the kingdom of God that we are already experiencing. This morning, we've seen that. As people are being baptized, this is a beautiful picture of the already of the kingdom. The fact that you're in the room worshiping King Jesus because you've been saved by the blood of the lamb. He's put his spirit in you. What is this? This is an already aspect of the kingdom. And we praise God for all the beautiful pictures. What we see going on around the world, people coming to Christ in unbelievable amounts of people coming to, coming to Jesus Christ for salvation. What is this? The already of the kingdom. But the fullness of the kingdom is not yet fully realized. The painful realities of the kingdom that have not fully yet been realized are are evident in our lives. We feel it. The fact that the kingdom is not fully yet realized is why I still sin and why you still sin. You ever been there at the end of a day 
And you're going, Scott, are you serious? Are you still struggling with that? Are you still doing those things, thinking those things? What is this? This is the kingdom not yet fully being realized in my life. The evil that we see, not in your own lives, but all over the world. Disease and sickness still strike when another person in our church gets a cancer diagnosis. When another person in our church dies unexpectedly. What is this? It's a right now picture that the fullness of the kingdom of God has not yet been realized. Evil happening all around us. Billions of people made in the image of God being treated without dignity or justice all over our world, but even all over our city. Right here in our backyard, we see evidences of the kingdom being not yet fully realized. The heartbreaking statistic that we've even just gotten used to in the, in the church that 73 million babies are killed every year around the world because of abortion. Aspect of the kingdom that we know this has not been fully realized. War and devastation, even this weekend, just more stories that if we're not careful as we scroll about what's going on in the world, we just become numb to. These are pictures of the kingdom of God that has not yet fully been realized. We say, what do we do? Lord, what do we do? Jesus tells us, smack dab in the middle of this already not yet kingdom, look at what he tells us to do in the model prayer in Matthew 6. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There are things happening all over the world, all over our lives that are pictures of the fact that the kingdom has not yet been fully realized. So Jesus says, here's your first step, pray. Let me ask you what I asked myself and was challenged with this week. Before I get all upset about the pictures of the kingdom not yet being fully realized, do I pray about the things that are making me so upset? And my prayer is not that some politician would fix it, my prayer is that the king of the kingdom would fix it because his kingdom is the only thing that can bring about some reconciliation to this broken world. God, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray, we pray, we pray. But a fascinating part of God's plan is how he intends to bring about the kingdom here on earth. What does the Bible tell us is God's plan to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It tells us very clearly the plan is you and me and us. We are the plan to expand the kingdom. Not we ourselves, not in our own strength. No, just what we've been talking about for seven weeks. As he lives his life through us, we are the plan. You say, get to put some Bible on that. Gladly, 2 Corinthians chapter five. Love this verse. Therefore, we as followers of Jesus are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal. What are these next two words? Through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You hear what that just said? We are ambassadors. Say, what's an ambassador? I looked it up because I wanted to make sure I knew. An authorized representative or messenger is what the dictionary says. So the king of the kingdom, this is so good. If we get this in our bones, the king of the kingdom, whose name is Jesus, he's, the king is overseeing the already and not yet aspects. And he has empowered us as ambassadors, as official representatives that he wants to do through us to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. This is an incredible call on every single follower of Jesus's life. And this is not something that we have an option that we can punt on. We've all been called as followers of Jesus to get involved in what God is doing all over the world. If you think about that, how wild is that? The king of the kingdom calls his sons and daughters to be the very agents he uses to expand the kingdom. Now, we need to be careful when we start talking this way to remind ourselves that God does not need us. He's not a needy coach just hoping you'll put the jersey on. He invites us because he's good, but he does not need us. I love how Dr. John Piper said it. He said, if we as a church are disobedient, it's not ultimately the cause of God and the cause of world missions that we'll lose. We will lose. God's counsel will stand. 
and he will accomplish all his purposes. His triumph is never in question, only our participation in it. I don't know about you, church, but I don't want to miss out. I don't want us as a church to miss out. Jesus said of his life, I must be about the kingdom. If we're honest, what was a must for Jesus has become a might for Jesus' followers. Right? If it works out, if it makes sense with my little empire that I'm here building, then I'll get involved in God's kingdom. Being about God's kingdom is not a maybe. It is a must. In fact, Jesus commanded it. This isn't on the screen, but many of you know in Matthew chapter 28, he gives us a a command. His disciples then and his disciples now, he simply says, go and make disciples. Expand the kingdom. There's no exception to that. You didn't find the Matthew chapter 29, because 28 is the last chapter in the book. In Matthew chapter 29, that doesn't exist. It doesn't say, go make disciples if it makes sense for you. Go make disciples if you have enough Bible knowledge where you feel equipped. Go make disciples if you get to a certain level of spirituality that you have come up with subjectively in your mind. <laughs> go. My spirit empowering you, go expand the kingdom. We call this the great commission. The great Hudson Taylor, 1800s, he's the missionary that brought the gospel to China. He said it plainly. He said, the great commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. As he lives his life through me, through us, my heart will start to look like his heart. What's on Jesus' heart? God's kingdom. But it's not just God's kingdom by itself. It's God's kingdom being expanded. I got to hustle. We are almost out of time, and I got a lot more to say. Luke 43, look at it again. Luke 443, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. This is clear in Jesus' life. It wasn't just about what was happening right around them. He said, there are other people that need to hear this. I must, I must, I must go to the other towns. What does that look like for us? As followers of Jesus, as we allow him to live his life through us, as what's on his heart gets on our heart, what does it look like for us to go to other towns? Well, at Hope Church, we have contextualized it based on Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you, this is Jesus talking, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. I love this verse because it's so all-inclusive. It's not just what you got going on in your city. It's not just in the surrounding area. It's all over the world. And I want you to think about when they heard this, the end of the earth. These are guys in the first century who don't have access to Google Maps. (laughs) They're not going, oh, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about all those countries that are out here, all, those, all, the, all that land and these massive expanse called the earth. No, no, they're like, is that like the 10 miles we walked the other day? What's all? He's giving them a command that they don't even understand the broad implications of when he gave it. And yet we do, and yet still, it's hard to convince people to go. Have you said this? I've said this. Man, why do we got to go to the nations when there's so much wrong going on in our city right now? Like, why do we got to go out and do more than just like right in front of us? Why do I have to go somewhere when what's going on here is hard enough? And the answer to that question is because Acts chapter one, verse eight exists in the Bible. It's very simple. It's not just in your city. It's not just in the surrounding areas. It's all over the world to the ends of the earth. See, now that I've been following Jesus for a while and I've gotten to go overseas and see what he's doing, I don't know if you resonate, but sometimes I can get so excited about what God's doing across the world that I forget that the mission's also across my street. I can get so excited about God's activity activity around the world that I forget that he wants to use me around my neighborhood. It's Las Vegas. That's our Jerusalem. That's what we've contextualized this at Hope Church for 23 years. How all-inclusive this verse is. Jerusalem for us is Las Vegas. You know this. We shared in the video earlier. Over 3 million people in our city now. But what's cool is that over a half a million people are internationally born. What does that mean? God is literally bringing the nations to our city. And there are people all over your street, maybe even all over your house that have no idea that Jesus came as a king to the kingdom to invite them into the kingdom and have a relationship with them. And maybe it's on you because God's empowered you to tell them to share in the mission right here in Las Vegas. But it's not just your city, it's the surrounding areas. He told them Judea and Samaria. For us, that's the West. That's the West. There's 13 states that make up the West Coast. I'm from the West Coast, so I always say West Coast is the best coast. There are 13 states in the best coast with 78 million people living in those states. 
Many, 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 many millions have no idea that Jesus desires a relationship with them. So what do we do? We plant churches. What do we do? We send teams. We're about what God's doing around the West Coast because we want to see more and more people meet Jesus because he's called us to expand, not just in Jerusalem, but Judea and Samaria, but also to the ends of the earth. For us, that's the world. You've heard us say Las Vegas, the West, and the world. Pastor Tom shared these stats last week, but 8.1 billion people. I remember when that was 7 billion. 8.1 billion people around the world, 195 nations represented it. But in those nations, there are over 12,000 people groups. You say, what on earth is a people group? A people group is a unique culture and a unique language. 12,000 plus people groups. And the stats say 4.8 billion of those people have little or no access to the gospel that we celebrate here for over an hour and a half every single weekend. And God's invited us to go, to share, to be a part of changing those statistics. So let's review. The heart of Jesus was, I must. What's on his heart should be on what's our heart or what's on our heart. The question I have for you today is, is it? Is what's on Jesus? Does any of this resonate with you? As we see these stats, as we see aspects of the kingdom that have not fully yet been realized, the brokenness of our world, just like Yvonne prayed earlier, is is our heart broken for what breaks his heart? Here's the second reality. That was all point one, by the way. (laughs) Here's point two. It's a lot shorter, I promise. My relationship to the world is dependent on my fellowship with the Father. My relationship with the world is dependent on my fellowship with the Father. Very simply, Jesus in this passage shows us when when the enemy of our selfishness, when the enemy of our flesh wants to rage and say, ah, I don't need to do that. That's for elite Christians. A lot of times we think the the greatest enemy that the enemy, the greatest enemy threat that the enemy uses is something like persecution, right? If if Satan can, can just persecute a bunch of Christians, then he'll snuff out the kingdom of God. That's actually shown to be the exact opposite from the first century and every century since. When you persecute Christians, one early church father said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. They get more emboldened, more empowered, and God's kingdom actually grows exponentially. That's why some of the most fastest growing areas of of faith right now in the world are some of the hardest places where it's illegal to be a Christian. The way I've tried to disciple my family is it's almost like some of our freedom has become our kryptonite. Because people who have no freedom, people who have no access to gather like this, the church is exploding there. So what's the greatest weapon? One of the greatest weapons the enemy uses is what we've been wrestling with for the last 30 minutes. It's our own selfishness, our own selfishness. I wanna show you, this is what they actually, they show us in this passage. Look back at Luke 4, 42. When it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. Did you catch it? They're just like we would be. Imagine Jesus in your midst right now. You would do everything you could to keep him. Like you got masterful preaching on display. This dude, it says that he spoke like nobody they've ever heard. Of course, it's God in the flesh. So they're like, this guy's teaching like we never heard before, but it's not just his, his, his masterful preaching. It's also his, his miraculous power. He's healing people in their midst. They're going, that guy was been crippled for decades. And Jesus said, you are healed. And he was. So what did they do? Exactly what we would do. They're saying, hey, Jesus, can we just keep you as the best kept secret on planet earth right now? (laughs) Please don't go anywhere else because we need you here with us. They were being selfish. They weren't looking at God's best. They were looking at what was in their best interest. And I hope you know, the enemy still does that with us. Our flesh, the enemy within, and Satan, the enemy without, would love for nothing else for us to just keep our little holy huddle together. Let's not take what's in here out there. But that's what God's called us to do. So how did Jesus overcome this obstacle? This pull to be self-absorbed. That's how our passage started. Look at it again. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. We see this all over Jesus's life. He would get away from the noise to be with his father, understanding that he was dependent on the father. We don't get much of a picture here in Luke four, but Mark 135 says it a lot plainer. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he, that's Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he 
prayed. Jesus maintained the heart of the Father through spending time with him. That's been the heart of this series. The call of our lives after this message is not to go out and say, sign me up for every trip. I'm a, do- I'm a go-getter. I'm a doer. I want to go. I want to go. Listen, if you are not dependent on the Father, it will be a, flesh, a flash in the pan. So that's why we set this series up the way we set this up. Every single thing. We'll put those words back on the screen. As you abide in Christ, your relationship with God, that overflows into connecting in community where we have unity and we're galvanized together because of our relationship with one another. And that overflows into sharing in the mission. Our relationship with the world, the life of a Jesus follower is not just a a pick your favorite one or two. That's how a lot of us treat that. Oh, I love abiding and I love going on missions, but I don't know about that connecting in community thing. I love connecting and I love sharing, but man, spending time with God has just been really hard for me and I've just kind of given up. This isn't a pick your favorite thing. This is as, as I abide in him, as I have a relationship with him, his life will look like my life. My life will look like his life as he lead, lives his life through us by the power of the spirit. And what did he say in this passage? He said, I must, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. After those 40 days of him talking about the kingdom of God, the Bible says he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And now he empowers us with that same purpose for our lives, to be about expanding the kingdom of God in Las Vegas, the West, and the world. Let's pray together this morning. God, thank you for your word. It's good, even when it's hard. It's true. And Lord, I pray right now for whatever you may be doing in the hearts of the people before me. Thank you for this church family, Lord. Thank you for how you move and work. Thank you for the lives that you're changing, not just today, but for 23 years. And as we respond, Lord, would you give us grace to respond well, respond with obedience. a couple ways to respond here. Just maybe ask the simple question is, what's on Jesus' heart on my heart? Like, does my heart break for what breaks his? If the answer to that is no, there's no condemnation. There's no shame. Listen, that's an invitation. That's an invitation to repentance to say, Jesus, make my heart look like your heart. And he will. He will. Maybe God's put something on your heart to maybe step out and to get some information about what it looks like to see the kingdom firsthand with your eyes, to go to one of those villages and see what he's doing around the world completely outside of a context, anything like yours. We'd encourage that. We'd love to see people signing up for trips, signing up to get more information about seeing God's kingdom and being about expanding it. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the king of the kingdom bids you come today. Come. He's done everything necessary to save you, to enter into a friendship relationship with you. And even in the midst of our service today, we could see the kingdom expand with another sinner who came home. We'd love to see that. We have pastors and prayer volunteers down here. If you have things on your heart you need to pray about, we'd love to pray with you. If you don't know Jesus and you wanna know about what it looks like to follow Christ, we would love to talk to you about that. Let's respond today as we sing. Jesus, you are good. Your kingdom is expanding even in our midst. And we say thank you. Do it more, Lord. Use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and respond as the Lord leads.